All righty, we're gonna get started. I'm gonna take a moment, share my screen. There we go. All right, so this is one of a series of copyright um, presentations that the library does. And this one is Copyright Matters in Dissertations, Theses, and Capstone. And uh, my name is Linda Kern. For those of you I have not met, I'm the Dean of the Trustee Library. And with me tonight is Thomas Waters. Thomas is our technical services librarian. And uh, he is the person that oversees the upload of your theses, dissertations, and capstones to ProQuest. He's the one who can solve your technical problems for you. So that's why we're both here tonight. So we wanna start off by explaining some of the background of copyright, how we get to where we are, are and why this matters. So first of all, what is copyright? It is the right of content creators to control their own work. By respecting copyrights, we respect the scholarship, creativity, and hard work of our colleagues. It's also the law, so another good reason to respect copyright. But I want to make clear that copyright and attribution are not the same thing. So attribution is when you cite it in APA. Attribution is when you uh, put a caption underneath uh, a chart or a table that you did, a photograph that you did. We're going to be talking about copyright tonight, not about attribution. So first of all, why does copyright exist? Well, the Constitution gives Congress the power to establish the rights of authors and inventors to their own work. And that falls right between their authority to collect taxes, to coin money, and to declare war. So obviously, they thought copyright was pretty dang important. It is a constitutional right. Copyright protection subsists in an original work. That means that there is some creativity involved an original work of authorship, a human author or creator that is fixed in any tangible medium of expression. So a tangible medium of expression is something that reproduces it. So digital, uh, film, uh, paper, all of those different things are a fixed and tangible medium of expression. Now, this handsome guy right here on your screen. This is Naruto. Naruto is a crested macaque who is very suave and debonair. And he took this selfie. He stole a photographer's camera and took this selfie of himself. Uh, after several years in the court system, it was established that Naruto does not own his copyright to his work because Naruto is not a human being. And so that's one of the other things that uh, is just interesting about copyright. Got to be human beings. Let's look at some examples of things that might be copywritten. So the category of literary works. Now you think literary, you think Shakespeare, right? It's much more than that. A literary work is someone's dissertation. Yours, somebody else's. A thesis, an article, an assessment, a blog post, all of these fall into that huge genre of literary works. It could also be a pictorial or photographic work, such as a photo, a drawing, a chart, an illustration, a floor plan. All of these things fall within the copyright law as granted by the Constitution so that folks who create these works can profit from them economically. So how long does somebody's 
copyright last? I create something. How long do I own the rights? The best answer to that is it depends. It depends on when the work was first created, when it was published, was it registered at the time? Is it an architectural work? Is it a sound recording? All of these things. The safest way to go is to assume that a work that is less than 95 years old is copyrighted, unless you know for some reason from a reliable source that it's not. So that's our first assumption of the night. Whatever you're working with that someone else created is copywritten. So what rights do these creators have? They have the right to reproduce their own work or to control its reproduction, digital reproduction, copies in classrooms, all of that. They have the right to control how their work is reproduced. They have the right to prepare derivative works and control those. That might be a modification to an assessment or a new addition to a textbook. They also have the right to control the public distribution of their work. And so in doing that, that means that they have the right to decide how, when, and who can post it on the web or publish in a book or disseminate it in any other way. There are other rights, but these are the ones that we're gonna focus on today. So one of the questions we often get, and I'm gonna address this head on right now, obtaining the right to use an assessment for your study. You have an assessment that you want to use. The assessment is valid and reliable. We're all excited about that. You obtain permission to use it in your study. That does not give you the right to reproduce it as an appendix in your dissertation or your thesis or your capstone. It does not give you the right to distribute it on the web by including it in your dissertation or thesis or capstone. These are separate rights that are given independently from the right to use it to assess your subjects. And that right is often given at a cost. So just keep that in mind. Authors and creators do assign their rights to other people, sometimes at a cost, sometimes for free. These rights can transfer to others. So one of the ways you might see them transferring is via a Creative Commons license. That is a great license. It is widely available, can be used by anyone. And that license allows someone the rights to distribute content, now distribute as in post on the web, to reproduce it, again, posting it on the web and distributing it, uh, to make copies of it. So a creative, creative Commons license transfers those rights to you so that you can include the work in your thesis or dissertation. Now, sometimes rights are transferred and they dead end. So I write an article, I get it published in an Elsevier journal. Elsevier is one of the top three largest publishers of scholarly material. They publish it, they take my rights. I have to assign my rights to them in order for it to be published. And then they tell the next person down the line, maybe you who wants to use it in your dissertation, that you may not copy it or display it or distribute it or reproduce it or do any of those other things. So Elsevier is retaining those rights and not allowing them to pass on to anyone else. Creative Commons, broad and wide open. Elsevier and other academic publishers, really, really tight. There are some exceptions to creators' rights. There is an exception to the matter of copyright in government works. So that's anything that you pull down off of a .gov site. 
So uh, anything from the Department of Education, anything from the CDC, uh, anything that comes from the government cannot be copyrighted. It's an exception to copyright law. There's another exception, and that's called fair use. And we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. So fair use is the really big exception. This is the one that allows you to quote someone in your dissertation or thesis or capstone. This is the one that allows you to include a small amount of text from someone else's work. So fair use was designed to protect free speech. And this whole thing is a balancing act, a balancing act of content users and content owners or creators, um, four factors. It is incredibly flexible, uh, almost too flexible for its own good because only the Supreme Court can make a designation as to what is legally fair use, but we've got some pretty good ideas and we can do a fair use analysis. When we are looking at fair use, first of all, the purpose of fair use, one of them is scholarship or research. So for your dissertation, thesis or capstone, you're good there because you're doing scholarship and research. It's not an infringement if it is a fair use. When we're determining fair use, we're balancing four factors. First of all, the purpose and character of the use, which we just talked about, an educational use leans toward fair use. A commercial use where somebody's gonna make money off of it, not so much fair use. The nature of the work, is the work highly creative? Now, there's got to be some, as we saw with Naruto, a modicum of creativity in the selfie or the work of any kind. So a phone book, mm, not considered creative. A list of facts, a process or procedure, again, not considered really creative. So if it's creative, it lends itself toward a fair use assessment. If it's factual, not so much. The amount and substantiality of the portion used is really important. This is why in the classroom, for copyright reasons, we can, for the most part, only show snippets of a video. We shouldn't really be showing the whole thing unless there's an overriding reason to show the whole thing. So if we use a small amount of someone else's work, like a short quote, then we're good as far as fair use goes. We can say, yeah, I've used a short quote. However, if you, like one of my students did once quoted, um, it was a page and a half single spaced and said that was one quote. Mm, no, that's a substantial portion of the work. So we can't use it. A photograph, if you show a small corner of that photograph, that's okay. If you show the whole photograph, not so much fair use. And the last factor, which is really important, is the effect on the market of the value of the work. So if I put somebody's assessment out there, I'm potentially affecting the market for that work, the ability of somebody to make money off of it. And that carries a whole lot of weight. So if I'm putting something out there that is in high demand and not readily available, I have an impact on the market and therefore not so much fair use. So this is a balancing act that we have to assess whenever we want to assume fair use. It's done so Professor Kern, do, are you taking questions during your presentation or do you wanna hold them to the end? Uh, we were going to hold them to the end, but Margaret, if you have a question, go ahead. Well, the first one, what is an assessment? Ah, in this case, we have a number of psychology and EDD students who are um, running studies that will require them to do some kind of educational or psychological assessment 
on their subjects and their studies. And so if you are using a psychological assessment for uh, depression or something like that, that's what I'm referring to. Okay, and so the other question I have, this fair use thing, you're saying, so for example, if I had a student that had a photograph of many things and they just wanted to crop it to show one thing, then why, then what's the difference between fair use and having to go get the permission of the manufacturer of all of those products that were shown in the picture and we just cropped it to show one, one thing? The copyright resides in the photograph itself not in the items in the photograph. And so the fact that the student is using the entirety of the photograph. No, but what if they're just using a little piece of it? I think I heard, that's what I don't understand. I heard you just say that if you use a little bit of a picture, then it's fair use. Does that mean you still have to get the permission of the manufacturer of that product? You don't have to get the, permission of the manufacturer of the product at all, but perhaps the owner of the copyright. However, you could probably build a case that if you're using just a small segment of the photograph, that it is fair use. Now, all of these other factors are going to come into play and substantiality is huge. And substantiality speaks to the heart of the work. Everybody remember the movie Psycho? You guys remember that? Uh, the shower scene, the eh, with the squealing and all of that, or um, I mean, we're almost on Halloween, right? So we've got Psycho, we've got, uh, oh, what was the one with Jack Nicholson that he kept on saying, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Yeah, Sharon knows what I'm talking about. So that those are considered the heart of the work. And those are more protected than any other scene that might not be so evocative of that work. So it just depends, Dr. Serrato, on um, the individual circumstance. But it's possible that a small segment of a photograph could certainly be used for fair use. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. There's going to be a test on this later, guys. Just saying. So then over all of this, so we're going to move on to the next one. Now, there will also be a PDF of this PowerPoint, and this fair use checklist will be linked. And so you'll have a fair use checklist that you can look at and evaluate fair use for yourself. So again, quoting small amounts of text, it's almost always going to be fair use. Don't worry about it. For attribution, cite the user, I mean, cite the author, but you're fine with quotes in your text as long as they're, you know, fairly small amounts. If you're using an entire anything, an entire photograph, an entire chart, an entire table, an entire assessment, an entire document, if you think you've got fair use, you can run a fair use analysis of it. Um, be honest with yourself, because most of the time, the use of an entire item, an entire creative work is not going to be found to be fair use for something that's going to end up on the web. And that's the key here, because that impacts the market. If it was something that was going to be shelved on your shelf and, you know, in the professor's possession and that was it, it'd be another thing entirely. Um, a license, by the way, we mentioned Creative Commons license. We mentioned um, publisher's licenses. They will often overrule fair use because they will say the license is readily available. So you can acquire the license that way. Quite often, you can find things that won't cost you or won't cost you that much money. But this fair use checklist is linked and it will be available to you in the PDF. So let's start applying some of the concepts. Dr. Serrato asked a great question. We've already began the application of this, but let's think about some of the things that uh, we're talking about here. So here's a process for analyzing your position with copyrighted material. 
you want to incorporate something into your dissertation or thesis. So the first thing you ask is the work I want to use protected by copyright. The answer to that's gonna be probably because it's probably less than 95 years old. Is there an exception that covers my use? Well, if it's a government document from the Department of Education, from NIH, from CDC, then that's your exception. You don't have to worry about copyright and you can go ahead and include it in your document. Is there a license? If something comes with a Creative Commons license, or if the website gives you permission to reproduce or distribute within certain circumstances, then you've got the license, and so you're good to go to include it in your thesis. Now, you still have to say where you got it from, and quite often they'll tell you how to say where you got it from, but you're good to include it. Is your use covered by fair use? Possibly, certainly with small amount of text. And do I need permission from the copyright owner for my use? Oftentimes you will. If none of the above applies, then yes, you'll need to get permission. And uh, sometimes that can be very easy, but it can take a little time. So as we said, Include it in your um, dissertation or thesis when you own the rights. For example, if you take the photograph, you own the rights to it. It can go in there. If it's not subject to copyright, if it's under a Creative Commons license, fair use, or you get permission. And by the way, I've included this video of copyright down here that will also be linked. If you haven't seen a fair use tale, it is snippets, fractions of Disney videos telling the story of copyright, which just makes Disney crazy because it is a fair use in this case. And Disney does not like that, but it's a lot of fun. So to obtain permission, if you have to obtain permission, if you're finding something on the web, go to the fine print at the bottom of the page. You may see something that says copyright policy. You may see something that says terms of use, uh, terms and conditions. There's several different phrases to it, but all of these things will link you to information on how you can use what you find on that website. And that would apply from uh, assessments all the way through to various pictures and works of art and that kind of thing. So I'm going to turn you over to Thomas now. And Thomas is gonna walk you through four scenarios. And this is where I need you guys to come through for us and tell us uh, what you think. This will give you a chance to assess your knowledge and actually apply it in certain scenarios. So tell us what you think. Thank you, Linda, and good evening. Now that Linda has provided some concepts regarding copyright, we do have four scenarios that we'll cover with you. Uh, I'll read the scenario to you and feel free to either unmute yourself or uh, enter your thoughts into the chat about what you would do in each instance. So scenario one, suppose you've researched interior design trends of public libraries in rural Georgia and you'd like to provide some photos to illustrate your conclusions. Some of the snapshots were photographed by you, uh, while others you found on the web. Are you able to include those photos in your work? Oh. I think there was a Mandy who said only your work, which you can. Professor Kern said that. But then if you have, have uh, obtained the rights to use the other ones that were not your photos, you can. Is that correct? Cool. So Linda, do you want to go on to the rationale? Okay, and I will say um, Kia weighed in on the chat and Kia says, 
No. There we go. So as we just said, the photos that you took yourself may be included because you're the copyright holder, but the photos found on the internet will require some closer inspection. If the entirety of the photo is used, it's likely not covered under fair use, but there are some other things you could look at, such as are the images licensed by the rights holder under a Creative Commons license? Or does the website on which you found the photos contain a statement providing permission to reproduce the content? If neither of those are true, you would need to seek out the copyright holder, keeping in mind that it might not be the website on which you found them, uh, and you need to request permission from the rights holder to reproduce the images. And Terrence said that just exactly what you said, Thomas, that if you get approval from the owner of the rights to the photographs, London says it depends on if the other photos are open access or not protected by copyright, or if you crop them into a small piece of the photograph that isn't yours. So I see that Karen asks government photos, would those be a fair use? And Linda, my understanding is that yes, if it's a photo that's a, a government, a federal government website, that that would be an exception to the, uh, the copyright law and that you would be able to use those. I agree. Now, London's use of the word open access. Do you want to talk to us now about open access? Well, we have a scenario coming up about open access. Uh, I think scenario two or scenario three. So should we okay. discuss it now or wait for scenario three? We can wait till scenario three. So you guys know there's something coming on that. Now, one thing Dr. Serrato asked us to make it clear that when you obtain the photograph, uh, excuse me, when you obtain the rights to include a photograph or an assessment or anything else in your work, it has to be in writing and it has to be in a photo, in a format that can be uploaded to ProQuest. So both of those things are gonna be very important because when we deposit or archive your work in this international database, the copyright permissions need to be in place. And Thomas can talk a little bit about um, formats and things like that within uh, when we talk about uploading to ProQuest. And uh, Sloan says, uh, ask permission and it was granted. Also, iPhoto sells photo. You bought the permission for a single use or specific times you could use. And that's a good point. Not only specific times, but specific ways that you can use it. They may tell you, for example, you may use it for a nonprofit educational purpose, but not for a commercial purpose. Do we want to move on to scenario two, Linda? We do, and I'm going to take two seconds to tell Sharon Shelton, thank you, and we will see that you get a copy of the presentation. She has another meeting that she's heading out to. All righty, next scenario. So scenario two, uh, suppose that uh, an assessment instrument that was used during your research on the psychology of teen faking would make a great appendix for your thesis. And attached to that instrument is a statement from its author granting you permission to use. Are you able to reproduce that instrument for your reader's understanding and convenience? Again, feel free to either unmute yourself or just input your thoughts into the, into the chat. And if you say no or yes, uh, feel free to explain why or why not.
Um, this is um, Terrence Favreroth. Um, I, I want to say yes, because it seems like the author giving you permission already to use it. So I've, I, I would assume that you, you're, you're able to use it as an appendix. So we have uh, several people weighing in on the chat. Uh, some people are saying no, and some people are saying, uh, yes, you can use it. So Linda, do you want to move on to the rationale? So the answer to this is that you would not be able to use it without explicit permission to reproduce because permission to use the assessment during the course of your research is not the same as permission to reproduce and distribute. Uh, those types of permissions are given separately. And so the assessment may be protected by copyright and if used in its entirety would not be covered under fair use. The caveat would be if you got the assessment from MIDS, which is the uh, measurement instrument uh, database for social sciences, I think is what that stands for, Linda. Uh, those assessments are available under Creative Commons licenses, which means that you may reproduce and uh, distribute those. Uh, for any other assessments that lack the explicit permission to reproduce and distribute, you would need to contact the copyright holder and request permission. Again, keeping in mind that the copyright holder could be the author or it could be a third party, such as a publisher like Elsevier. Linda, you're muted. Of course, a lot of people wish they had that button on me. So um, I'm gonna split some hairs here. Permission to use is when you have an assessment of any kind, the instrument, the uh, author of that instrument or the owner of the instrument gives you the rights to use it to assess your subjects as part of your study. That's one use. Another kind of use that you do not automatically get permission for is the right to reproduce that assessment. Now by reproducing it, I mean taking a digitized copy and making another digitized copy of it. I mean taking a digitized copy and printing it out and putting it in a hardbound thesis. You also do not have the right to distribute it. When you deposit your thesis capstone or dissertation on the web, on ProQuest, you are distributing that instrument. And so unless you have specific written permission to distribute or reproduce, well, and reproduce and distribute that work, then it cannot go in your capstone or thesis as an appendix. So even though you have permission to assess your subjects using it, and that would include the right to, to make a copy so that they could mark the answer sheet, perhaps, that kind of thing, you do not have permission at the same time to reproduce it and distribute it on the web, to put it into your thesis and turn that into either an ETD, an electronic thesis or dissertation, or to turn it into a printed volume. However, you may request and receive those rights from the author. And if your assessment comes from MIDS, which is a great source, then it is covered by the exception of a license and a Creative Commons license may allow you to do that. You just have to read the fine print. Linda, this yes, is, this is Melissa Huffstetler. So I have a question. Okay. Well, actually, two. Okay. So I have received approval from the author of the instrument, and she sent me the instrument, mm -hmm. and I have the whole email. So I can just only put her letter as my appendix. I would talk to your chair about that. 
uh, in terms of putting the letter in as an appendix. Um, that may just be a simple thing to note in your, um, in your text that the instrument was used with the author's permission. The appendix would be if the author gave you specific permission to include the text of the assessment in your thesis. Okay, so then for my theoretical model, when I have the email from my person saying, please use this in your thing, is okay to use that? This is the actual picture of the model I want you to use. And as long as generally the best and safest way is to for them to actually say, yes, you may reproduce it and distribute it. If they say something that is a little vaguer, and a lot of times, it's, you know, from individuals without a phalanx of attorneys behind them, they may say something about, um, you can use it in your dissertation, you can include it in your dissertation. So if it looks really clear from the phrasing that the author used the, or the person that owned the copyright used, that they understand that you want to put this in your dissertation that you're going to archive electronically, then you're good to go. A lot of it will depend on the phrasing they use. If you have not yet done that email, and now I know, Melissa, that you have, but if for someone who has not yet sent that email saying, I want permission to use your particular instrument, um, ask for permission to use the instrument in the study and reproduce it in the appendix of your dissertation, which will be archived with dissertation abstracts. Because if you ask for all of that and all you get back is a one word yes, you're good to go. Okay, so then if we just use it for our whole defense purposes, we just need to pull it before we upload it. Yes, and okay. Thomas is going to address that as well. Absolutely. Right. Thank you so now, much. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Now, Mandy Summit said, so if you purchased a software that is needed for the assessment, such as in vivo, the graphs and such that are designed by this software can or cannot be used. The, in other words, you're in putting your data into in vivo and in vivo is analyzing your data and spitting it back out to you. You can use the graphs because that is your data. You created that graph, graph based on your work and the responses of the folks in your study. So Mandy Summit, you are good to go using the data that is generated by in vivo. What you could not do is if Thomas Waters did a study and used in vivo to analyze it. That might be a problem because he was the author and the owner of that. And Thomas, I think we are getting to that. Am I jumping the gun here? Uh, we do have uh, a scenario about that. It's our okay. uh, next, next scenario. Let's move on to that then. And we'll talk about it in terms of the scenario. So scenario three, suppose that you're conducting research to correlate standardized test scores with time spent playing video games among Hall County high school students. You found an open access journal article on the web that includes a graph depicting this correlation in another school district. Can you reproduce this table so your readers can compare those conclusions with your own? What you think, guys? So we have one no. We have another no and a yes.
And Margaret Serrata says, if, yes, if you get permission. So again, we have a, a mixture of responses, some no, some yes. You wanna go through the rationale? You wanna go under the rationale, Linda? So open access and public domain are not the same. Open access articles are still protected by copyright and fair use exceptions likely don't apply if you're using the entire table. If the article is published under a con Creative Commons license, the table may be reproduced and distributed in your dissertation. But if there's no explicit permission to reproduce and distribute, you would have, still have to contact a copyright holder and request that permission. Uh, and that has the same caveat that I've made with the other scenarios that the copyright holder could either be the author or it could be a third party such as the publisher. So let's be uh, sure we understand open access. Let's delve into that just a little bit. Open access means that it is easily available on the web. It's not behind a paywall. It's not behind a subscription wall. You can access it on the web. It is open access. Open access does not mean without copyright. For example, Elsevier, the publisher that I gave you before, publishes a small number of articles every month that are open access. However, they still retain the copyrights to you, to those articles. And if you try and use them in a way that is prohibited, they will beat you up. And so just because it's open access doesn't mean that in the it is in the public domain, which is a technical term, meaning it's passed out of copyright because it's aged out of copyright or because it's a government document. So do keep that in mind that open access is not copyright free. Open access is copyrighted and you can only give those rights away with a license or permissions of some kind to use and reproduce it. Any more questions on that? Because that's a real- I have a question. Yes, Professor Kern, I have a question. So let's say that I don't wanna reproduce the chart or the table, but I want to like in my literature review, just summarize it or say what the chart showed. That's just a typical citation. I don't have to get permission from the author, right? I mean, I'm just citing it as I would any other data I found in the literature review. Absolutely. So and right? data itself is factual. And so is not in its, in the form here that you're taking it and you're summarizing it, you're fine. I mean, that's, that's a fair use because it is uh, for a, an educational purpose, it is more factual. Uh, you are not using the entirety of the table. You're not giving every bit of that data and reproducing it. And so you're in really good shape. Okay, thank you. Very good point. Thank you so much. And Katie Anderson says, what about charts and graphs from the Bureau of Labor Statistics? Is that considered open? Thomas, you want to field that question about uh, charts and graphs because Thomas is a former government documents librarian. Yeah, Bureau of Labor Statistics would be a federal government publication, and so that would be an exception to copyright law. You would not need to get written permission from the Bureau or the, uh, the researcher within the Bureau in order to reproduce that. And Kia ask a question. As long as, long as you cite it, as long as you give the citation. No. Is that right, Thomas? Okay. Kia ask a question. What is meant by um, open access journals? 
And that is, there are two models of publishing journals. One is the model whereby, um, and you'll find a lot of these uh, journals in Education Source uh, and Academic Search Complete databases that y'all are all used to um, using. So those are for-profit publishers and they put their work behind a paywall and somebody, either us in the library or y'all have to pay to get to it. Open access journals have a different model and open access journals means that I'm going to pay a fee to be published in that open access journal. And that fee ensures that the journal can be profitable enough to continue in existence. So I'm paying on the front end to make my work available to a wider group of people. So an open access publishing model simply means that somebody else is paying for it in a different way, but the work in it is still copyrighted. So Kia, if you were to publish in an open access journal, the chances are that you would retain your copyright or you would have to sign it over to the journal itself and they would retain the copyright on it. Linda, we do have a question from Yolanda who says, what about graphics that explain a theory? Do we need permission to use the author's graphics? Oh my gosh, that brings to mind a nightmare uh, in the OT department that we ran into a few years ago. Uh, there was a graph describing a theoretical model and the students wanted to use that graph. It was the best way of communicating what that model was to the readers of their thesis. And so that graph that uh, of the model had been published in two places. It had been published in a textbook and it had been published in a journal. The textbook gave permission to use the graph in the uh, thesis. The journal did not give permission. And since they both own the copyright in this case, the journal, which was a core journal of occupational therapy, kept the OT students from including it in their dissertation. So what they did was they included it for the copy for the committee. So the committee would understand that they knew what they were talking about, but it was redacted from everything else. So graphs that explain a theory are the same thing as any other kind of chart or table and you definitely have to get permission to use them. So would it be best to uh, make my own interpretation of that thought? Uh, so instead of using their Venn diagram, give my concept of what that would look like? Absolutely. Okay because then it becomes your creative expression of their idea. Okay, I just wanted to be clear. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. And Mandy Summit, thank you for coming. Enjoy your time with your chair. Have we gotten all the questions so far? We, are we ready to move on? All right. So the last scenario, uh, suppose uh, you want to support your research on infant mortality in the state of Georgia, and you'd like to incorporate tables from the CDC's National Vital Statistics Reports. Are you able to reproduce those tables? and everyone is saying yes, because it's a government publication. And the answer is yes, you can reproduce those because 
government publications are an exception to the copyright law. You do not need to obtain the permission of the authors. Well done, guys. Well done. So suppose that you have uh, finished your thesis or dissertation. It's uh, been approved by your committee and you're ready to submit to the library. What happens next? Well, you're going to upload your paper to the thesis and dissertation submission portal. Uh, and there are very detailed instructions for doing that on the thesis and dissertation libguide, which is linked from the library website, library.bernal.edu. Uh, and if you have any permissions, any, any copyright permissions that have given you the permission to reproduce that material, uh, you'll also have the ability to upload those at the same time. Uh, it's not necessary to include those within your thesis and dissertation document. There's a separate section for that on the upload portal. Uh, and once you finish that submission, uh, it'll come directly to me and I will review your document to make sure that you have the signature page from your committee. Uh, and I'll also review it for any copyright issues. Uh, and this is all important because any copyrighted material that comes to me that you don't have permissions for and that you're unable to get permissions for uh, will end up having to be redacted before we can do the final submission to ProQuest. And so uh, if you don't have the permissions for it, you can't get the permissions for it, it's just going to add extra steps to the process for you uh, of having to edit your thesis or dissertation again before we can make the final send off to ProQuest. So Linda, that's all that I have. What questions do you all have for us? Uh, either uh, just in general about these concepts or about your own projects that you're working on. While y'all are thinking of questions, uh, Dr. Serrato made a point a couple minutes ago that kind of brings us full circle with this. Copyright and attribution, i.e. citing things, are two different things, but just because you've taken care of all the copyright issues, don't forget you have to cite this stuff. Everything has to be correctly cited in the APA style just because of your academic integrity, just because it's the right thing to do to let people know what your sources are and who has done this work. So, don't forget that copyright is only one side of it, that attribution, citing all of your charts, your tables, your photographs, if you didn't take them, everything, as well as all of those sources that you used in your literature review all have to be cited. Um, Kia had a question for you, Thomas. Yeah, uh, I answered that. Um, oh. I believe uh, she is this the question about uh, accepting Word and, and not Google Docs. Um, actually, uh, yes. Or did I miss one? No, no, you're right. That was it. I, I replied in the chat and said that the ProQuest upload portal requires PDF format. And Katie Anderson's asking about citing a definition from Webster's. Is that acceptable? Um, I'm going to probably step on chair's toes, advisor's toes right now, but I'm going to say that there is a better source than Webster's. Webster's is a general all-purpose dictionary that is written at what, a fifth or sixth grade level. You would be much better served by using a subject dictionary or a subject encyclopedia because a word has a specific meaning based on its context. And so if you're using a word in a psychological context, it's gonna be very different from the word in everyday usage, potentially. The same thing for education. I mean, you all have your own languages. So it's better to go to a subject dictionary. We have a database, it's called Credo, C-R-E-D-O, Credo, and it has all kinds of subject dictionaries in it. If you can't find what you need 
email us, uh, go to one of our LibGuides and hit up one of the librarians that's on that LibGuide or email us at library at bernal.edu, sorry, library at bernal.edu, and we will get you a good source for your definition that is appropriate for your academic subject. Um, would it be possible to have our thesis or dissertation professionally reviewed by a librarian? And I lost it, hang on. For plagiarism, yes. Um, we cannot look at an entire dissertation. We can look at it for patterns and trends. Uh, however, most of our departments will set up a mechanism so that you can deposit your um, thesis or dissertation to turn it in. And Turnitin will tell you whether or not it's finding plagiarism, and then you can evaluate that and interpret it. Uh, I know that that happens in psychology. It happens in ED 960 as well. And um, if somebody wants that for the major EDD site, uh, I'm meeting with uh, Dr. Kelly Brock Simmons tomorrow, you can let me know that you'd like to see that and I will talk to her about it. But the best way to check your whole dissertation or thesis is just to run it through Turnitin and see what comes up. Rebecca is asking about the average timetable in submitting a dissertation to publication. And that depends on whether or not you're giving ProQuest everything they need on the front end. Thomas, you wanna go into more detail there? Uh, we're using publication to refer to uh, the process of getting, the, getting it sent off to ProQuest, uh, then if, everything is turned into me um, at the same time, which would be the, the submission by you, the uh, permissions form, and then the departmental checklist form. Uh, and assuming that there's no copyrighted material in your dissertation that we would have to deal with, the process on my end takes about five minutes. Now, it will take a while for ProQuest to make it available. And that varies depending on the time of year because there's some stuff that happens uh, once I send it off to them. Uh, and so I've seen it take just a few days before it becomes available on the ProQuest site. And then I've also seen it take a couple of months. And I'm gonna split one more here. We don't consider this to be publishing because you may take your dissertation and whittle it down to an article size and publish it in a journal. By archiving or depositing, again, those are those technical definitions, by archiving or depositing with ProQuest, most journals do not consider that to be a previous publication. We can also embargo at your request your work in ProQuest, meaning that the full text will not be available for a period of time to give you a chance if you want to publish an article based on that. If you're curious, let us know. Kia wants to use questions from a 2006 dissertation and modify them to be relevant to today's teaching. Yeah, that is gonna take some modification, isn't it, Kia? Um, do dissertation authors submit Ah, the author is the owner. ProQuest does not take ownership of copyrights. Really good question there. So ProQuest, when you deposit your thesis with them or your dissertation or your capstone, they will not take ownership of the copyright. And so that is the author that you'll want to email. 
what if the uh, author Linda later did an additional article or they published that, they, they whittled it down, as you said, into a, a, an article for a scholarly journal and submitted that same question? Um, the chances are that the assessment would not be published because oh of the length of an article. However, Kia, Thomas makes a point, and that is ask the author, do you own the copyrights to this assessment? If so, will you give me permission to modify the assessment, use the assessment, and then reproduce and put it into my um, dissertation, which will then be posted on ProQuest? If the author has passed, we want these authors to live a long time. Uh, that becomes a question well beyond my legal ability. Uh, if someone has that issue, I'll be glad to take a look at the specific circumstances and point you in the right direction there. But we want these folks to live a long and happy life. Is there anything else? And I have a question that's similar to Kia's question, the last one that Kia just asked about the dissertation question. Um, I wanna ask about, so I've already contacted one of the librarians and a uh, librarian has helped me to say that my appendix A for my dissertation, um, I should contact this other person that I'm using for the dissertation. Um, I mean, meaning the dissertation of someone else, their, their appendix, but I've modified it. However, my dissertation chair says it should be attribution. And so I'm in between like, what do I do? Where should I fall? Like, I mean, the librarian is saying I should reach out for copyright, but then she said you should defer to your chair, but then the chair says it should really probably be attribution and you don't need to go through those those steps and I'm kind of stuck. And Mandy, you're saying that you're going to modify an assessment instrument that was published in someone else, not published, that was included in somebody else's dissertation? That's that correct. Right? Yeah, and I know the person's still living. I know, I mean, the librarians helped me to find um, his contact information, but I'm just kind of don't wanna step on toes and go in a... You will not be able to upload it to ProQuest without that permission. So what if it's like super general questions because it's a qualitative study as well. And it's like, if, for example, um, what are your experiences in online learning? That's literally like the same question that I'm asking. And it's that's why it's in this really great area. There's a list of kind of general, general questions. That is really, really general. Are you using all of this author's questions? No, because I'm, I mean, they're, very, they're modified, but like that, that one is real, literally word for word question of what experiences that do you have with online learning? And that could be asked with anybody because it's a, exactly. Uh, yeah. Mandy, let's talk about it. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I need to look at it and we'll talk about it because I'm thinking that we can probably modify this to the point where it doesn't bear a whole lot of relation to the original one, unless you're trying to reproduce that study. Are you trying to reproduce that study? Oh, well, I'm not completely reproducing the study, no. But what I'll do is I'll afford I'll you my specifics and then you can help me. Yeah, we Thanks. need to take a look at that because I can see where your chair is going with this because the questions are so general. And I'm thinking maybe we just make the whole thing so general that it becomes your creative output. So let's talk. Thank you. All right, everybody, I'm gonna stop my share. You have hung with us for an hour and five minutes of content. And we appreciate you guys very much. Um, if there are any further questions, uh, the PowerPoint will be posted and you and uh, you can email either me about your general copyright questions or you can email Thomas 
it's going to be posted. You guys all know our LibGuides. Everybody's got their own LibGuides. So LibGuides, L-I-B-G-U-I-D-E-S dot Bernal dot E-D-U slash copyright. It will be there and it will be on libguides.bernal.edu slash thesis. It will also be posted on the EDD student site and on the um, psychology student site. And if there's anybody else who wants me to post it somewhere, just let me know and I'll be glad to share the uh, MP4. So thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate that. And we will see you later. Thank you, Professor Kern. Thank you, Mr. Waters. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. You have made it a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.